white text over video of past events. Logo, Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium. Professional Development Series presents. Serving older adults in cultural institutions. At the front of a room, seated at a table are four women. Above them is a screen with projected captions and slides. To their left, a woman stands at a podium and addresses the audience. Welcome, my name is Christina Gunther and I am the founder and co-chair of Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium, CCAC. Um, and we are a volunteer-run nonprofit organization all about empowering Chicago's cultural spaces to become more accessible to visitors with disabilities. Um, we really appreciate, since we are volunteer run and now a nonprofit, very much appreciate your donations, which you can drop off in the back, but $5 suggested donation to help keep programs like this going. We're really fortunate that we can keep them free, but if you do have a couple bucks to spare, it would go a long way. Um, how many of you have been to a CCAC program before? Raise your hands. And you can make some sounds too, some noise. Why not? <laughs> All right, so that seemed like maybe 15 or 20 people raised their hands. Um, how many of you is this your first time coming to a CCAC program? You can make noise too, even though you're new. Welcome, welcome. So that was obviously a lot more people there, um, if we do some math. Um, we wanna welcome everyone to this program. We're really excited. I think there's a lot to talk about, and this is just gonna be the tip of the iceberg today, but it's good to get the conversation going, and we're excited to continue it with you all. A few housekeeping reminders. First of all, we have assistive listening devices. If anyone has hearing loss and would like to use them, we have them in the back. You can check in at the registration desk to ask for more information. Um, we ask that everybody uses a microphone. We will have a Q&A at the end. Please make sure to wait until a microphone comes to you before you start to speak. We wanna try to be as accessible as possible. We also are really fortunate to have the great Kathy Raycan providing captioning for us, which appears on the top of the slides to my left. Woohoo! Woo go Kathy! Um, so, anyway, CCAC is all about having a safe space for us to talk about access and inclusion topics. So, we want everyone to feel really safe and respected. If you're new to this access journey or you're returning, we want everyone to feel welcome and we want you to feel really comfortable to ask questions as long as they come from a place of respect. There's no such thing as a wrong question. So please, please thank, uh, join me in thanking Lucas Livingston and the Art Institute for hosting us. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Lucas. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Christina. Thanks, uh, everyone, for, for being here today. Uh, and you know another housekeeping thing. We we do have more cups on the way, so you know, critical things. And Kathy, now I have a new nickname for you, Kathy the Great. <laughs> well, anyway, yeah. My name is Lucas Livingston. I'm I'm really pleased to um, to have been asked to be the moderator of our discussion today. And uh, let's meet our contestants. Um, so, yeah. um, so uh, just very, very brief introductions. And uh, as you see on screen here, uh, lists who our panelists are. So, Louise, Dr. Louise Hockley is uh, from the, is a senior research scientist at NORC, the uh, the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Karen Coldflut is the founder and principal of Age with Ease, uh, a, a professional gerontologist, so which uh, Karen will certainly be addressing uh, the ins and outs of the gerontological profession. Uh, we're also joined by Deb Delsignor. Deb is a professional art therapist. She is the uh, adjunct associate professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And uh, Deb and I work very closely together on the Art Institute's Art in the Moment program for people with dementia and their care partners. And we're going to share a lot more about that program with, uh, with everyone. And then uh, certainly, uh, uh, not least, but finally, we have uh, Hillary Pearson. Hillary is the manager of operations at the Harris Theater for Music and Dance. And, uh, and Hillary is also a, a steering committee member for the CCAC. Uh, I, at the Art Institute, am uh, Assistant Director for Accessibility and Lifelong Learning in the Department of Learning and Public Engagement. Uh, and 
uh, a, a former CCAC steering committee member. Yay! So, <laughs> um, so for our topic today, we're addressing uh, aging. So older adults, uh, individuals, um, but what do we mean by that today, in the, this day? Uh, and uh, so who are we, who is, who is the, uh, the, the topic of the hour, or two hours we have, right? And uh, so we're going to be addressing the uh, intersection of aging and disability, uh, specifically wanting to highlight not, well, not only lifelong disability, but especially uh, age-related disability, uh, disability that is acquired later in life. Um, and we will also be discussing, certainly heavily uh, pointing to the, um, the, the power of arts and cultural engagement for, for all, but especially for older adults, uh, what that means to individuals, how the arts, I like to say that the arts really sh should, and there's a national, growing international recognition that the arts uh, um, should be part of our overall just wellness and, and health regime, right? Um, we, we, we hear about uh, in other countries of the world, doctors are actually prescribing uh, museum and, and, and theater and cultural enrichment uh, instead of medicine, right? Or maybe in addition to medicine. So, but it's, it should definitely be part of our overall uh, health and wellness for healthy living and healthy aging. So we're going to get in heavy and thick into that. Uh, but I want to right away go ahead and uh, hand things over to Louise, who will be uh, introducing us to the aging population, uh, and so, so we can learn more about that. Thanks. I'll get right from the foundation here, talk about who is our audience that we're talking about, the older adults. I'm thinking here that we're going to be pretty uniformly talking about people who are 65 and older. You can define that differently, but the statistics I'll give you here have to do with that population. Um, figures from 2016, we had 51 million older adults, which was 16% of the total population. I'll just throw your mind forward to 2060, where that population will be a quarter of the total population of the country. Um, we also know that there are 34 million silent generation older adults still with us, 17 million baby boomers already in that group, and that is about to grow. You will see that little figure on the right of, I think sometimes think of it as, as a rat swallowing um, I mean, a snake swallowing a rat, and the rat is the baby boomers as they're bulging their way up through the tract, and they're a big group, and you can see that as we go along in time, the left panel shows 20, can't see, 1960, so you can see that there's a, a large population of younger kids, that's the baby boomers being born, and then as you look to 2060, they're all in the upper part of the graph being pushed out the other end. I want to draw your attention to generational changes because the older adults that you have been serving are gradually but surely shifting in their demographics. You're going to see baby boomers having a higher level of education on average. They're going to live longer, so you're going to have them in the system longer, you might say. They're more likely to be obese and have a disability. So this is a, going to be a very needy population. They're not necessarily unhealthier in the traditional sense, in that they are going to are already benefiting from advances in the treatment of cardiovascular disease and diabetes and so on. But they're not going to be living high quality because of, of disabilities. They're less secure financially. So if you think you've already got a problem with addressing a population that can't afford the cultural amenities, that's not going to get better. And they're going to be more racially and ethnically diverse for whatever that means to the kinds of programming you're considering. The figure here on the right is again showing just the baby boomers pushing their way up the highlighted strip, moving from 19, can't see it, all the way through 26. 1945, that's the first year roughly when the baby boom started. Um, 
For the population 65 and older, I just wanted to give you an overview. This is a plot by county where the light yellow has populations that are less than 15% that age. Um, the light green are 15 to 22 or so, I can't read that either. And the blue is over 22%, um, 65 and older. So if you can zoom in there to Cook County and the city of Chicago, we're in one of the low aged population. We're a relatively young county relative to some. When we talk about older adults, in my field, which it, we, I look a lot at how social relationships affect health during aging, we often hear and we talk about social isolation and loneliness. I want to talk about that in a sense too, because cultural activities are used to manage feelings of loneliness. But I want to make the distinction when you are seeing people and you think they are lonely, you have to be careful to not equate loneliness with social isolation and that social isolation is, is just a feature of their circumstance. Are they relatively alone? It's not just are they living alone, but do they not have other people that they can interact with on some regular basis? Do they have a very small network? Do they not get the kinds of support they need when they, they want it because of not having those people around? Loneliness, on the other hand, is the feeling of isolation. And anybody who has felt lonely probably also knows that you can feel lonely even when you have a lot of other people around. It's very subjective and what we really, one of, the, one of the other key differences is, what you really see in loneliness is this distress. It's unpleasant. People can be relatively alone by choice. It doesn't have to necessarily make them feel lonely. So you have to be able to distinguish what it is that you're, you're interested in dealing with when you have a, an older adult population. Why should we care about those features anyway? So I have a, a figure here of a tombstone to illustrate the fact that there's a good sized body of research now linking loneliness and social isolation with increased risk for premature mortality, <clears throat> for poor physical health, for poor mental health, for poor cognitive health, you know, the increased incidence and earlier incidence of cognitive impairment and dementia as well as other physical ailments and disability is one of those, as well as other diseases. The other reason to care is that it's costly. Um, you get an increase, a huge increase in healthcare costs. It's a fairly new study that used Medicare data and compared people, older adults who were socially isolated, meaning they had very few of those social connections I was talking about, they probably did not have a spouse, they didn't have, have many friends, they didn't belong to groups, they didn't attend church, truly isolated. From those who were less isolated, the estimate there was that, that the healthcare system, the federal government, your taxes, were paying $1,600 extra for each isolated older adult, which amounts to this huge figure of $6.7 billion a year in funding for these people. So what has that got to do with arts and culture? Well, there are um, growing pieces of evidence that show that cultural engagement is very protective. People who engage in cultural activity, who either attend or participate in arts of some kind, um, show benefits in terms of how lonely they feel, quality of life more generally. First one that I wanted to point to was a, a study that looked, this is in the UK. By the way, a lot of the research at least recent research has come out of the UK in this regard because they are ahead of us in the age bubble. Their older adults got older sooner and they've got a bigger bulge and they've been dealing with this issue a, long, a little bit longer than we have. So receptive engagement, actually going to attend, listening rather than actually making anything. What people here might do if they're coming to the Art Institute, receptive engagement at least every few months reduce the odds that older adults became lonely over a 10-year follow-up period. That's just receptive engagement. Theater and drama participation also has widespread health benefits. And this is a review of a number of these types of studies that have found that there's a, a benefit to participating uh, in these types of cultural activities, arts activities. Um, I've underlined that the aesthetic value and quality of the drama matter um, that should be self-evident, but I, I think I'll come back to that later. If I don't, you can nudge me. 
Another a study that um, did a review, and this is by Noyce et al., and this is a fellow who's been in, um, his wife I think, they've been in Elmhurst for some time, very well known in the field. His review of research in this area also shows that participatory arts engagement, whether it's dance, theater, music, visual arts, has a range of benefits, not only for you know, feelings of loneliness, connectedness, and quality of life, but actual physical health outcomes, like how good that singer doing dance, that actually can improve people's balance and their speed of walking. So one might ask, and you've probably asked this of yourselves in your organizations, what is it that motivates people to participate? And there are research findings trying to sort of this cluster of you know, things that have been identified. It's intrinsically pleasant, pleasurable to take part. People find they get social support in these group arts contexts. Some people really, they value the stimulation and the potential to be productive in those contexts. They may take great satisfaction with creating something. Or a more generic, if you want to call it that, higher arching value, which they see as being more meaning in their life for having participated. Some of you might be familiar with the NEA having done a study back, it was published back in 2015. I'm showing you an image of the front page, or at least one of the early pages in this report, <clears throat> where they were looking at receptive engagement in the arts and what it is that motivates people here. And they found that the social aspect, socializing was important, learning was important, especially important for the older adults that they polled. This was a nationally representative study was the older adults really valued the experience of high quality art. So that's another reappearance of this importance of the quality of it. And they also appreciated having the opportunity to support the community through their engagement. They also saw barriers, and these probably won't look unfamiliar to you. There is an issue of, of time. This is particularly relevant for younger adults, not so much for older adults, but cost is a big issue across the board, not less for older adults. <clears throat> access, and by access, it's the kinds of things you're talking about here. They may be interested in going, but if they can't get over the door jam at the entrance, or can't navigate the stairs, or whatever it might be, that's going to be an, a barrier for them. And then the social aspect comes out in the reverse. People don't go if they don't have someone to go with. And those two asterisk ones are particularly pronounced among older adults. other things that you have seen, disability, whether it's mobility, sensory impairment. It's amazing how much we overlook the value of something like smell. <laughs> that that, even though it may not be part of a display or part of an activity, becomes a crucial part of one's total experience. And lacking that may impoverish it to some degree. Of course, cognitive disabilities play into this. I think we'll hear more about this from other speakers. <coughs> Diseases, I've mentioned access, appeal. <coughs> so is this an activity that people, older adults, will find acceptable or appropriate, engaging, worthwhile? And I mention this because, in particular in the case of people <coughs> who are lonely, it's too easy to assume that anything we give them will be appreciated, that it's better than nothing. A big part of loneliness, a big part of being human, is having some sense of autonomy and control over what it is that you take part in and participate in. And you have to be able to give people choices. And they will choose what they find worthwhile, and you can learn from them what makes sense for the audience you're serving. And they will possibly also fear social rejection or exploitation. That's another barrier. And that's also particularly pronounced in people who are lonely and already feeling vulnerable and sensitive to social rejection. If they were to risk that further in an activity, that could be bad news. Um, I want to quickly mention a study that was done in 2012. <clears throat> Again, a population-based study. This is a general social survey. And for one of the first times, they found something out something about the population who were interested but didn't attend. Who are those people? These are the people you're probably trying to reach. And so what they found, let me go back one. Access matters. 
whether it's someplace they can get to, not only versus, like if it's rural versus urban and you know how far away they are, but whether they can get in. That was a big concern for 47% of those who would have attended if only they could have had access. Lack of someone to go with, I mentioned this before. For older adults, that's a big one again, 36%. These bars represent different age groups. The last bar is the oldest age group. They're the ones who are most likely to identify that as an issue for being able to satisfy their interest in attending. And for a smaller proportion of older adults, more among younger adults, it's lack of time. I have put on the resources sheet a number of other jump in the gun here, number of other resources, ways that have, have been published or unpublished, but are ways that groups that have experience in this domain have learned to address some of the barriers. transition over to Karen who's going to tell us a lot more. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm, I'm loving all of these incredible references and, and all the, the articles we're referring to, and, and we're just getting started. Um, but don't feel like you have to scramble and write everything down because the, this you can download this whole PowerPoint. You might have seen the URL at the beginning. Uh, we'll, we'll flash that up again. What was it? Tinyurl.com slash CCAC2019 aging. All right, and, 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 we, and we include all these resources and references in the PowerPoint, so, um, so you can just go to town, uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy, and absorb. Thanks. So yeah, with that, Karen, thanks. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me in the back? You're okay in the front as well. Good. Um, so I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you, Lucas. It's really a treat to be with such a diverse group of cultural institutions from across the city and beyond. Um, just before I get started, I had uh, a couple quick questions. So when you think about your institution, who attends your events, who attends um, your plays or programming, um, how many would you say, a show of hands, how many, what percentage of that audience is over 50, is over age, let's say 60, by your estimate? So maybe 50% are over age 60. I see one, two, three people, uh, four or five. Okay, how about 25% over age 60? Okay, um, what percentage of your volunteers are over age 60? 50%? 25%? Okay, so I'm seeing more hands at 50% than 25%. And how about your donors? Over 50% over age 60? Okay, I'm seeing a good quarter of the group here. And how about 25% over age 60 donors? Okay, a few more added on. So as you can see, while we may only have about 15% of people over age 60 in Cook County, but we see a, a greater emphasis of older adults both as participants and uh, users of the arts. We see a greater percentage in volunteers, certainly, uh, especially when you add in organizations like the Angels, maybe your docents, excuse me, your uh, ushers that you're using at performances, and certainly of donors. So um, really, um, at every age, art can provide a respite from our daily lives. It's a place to imagine new things a uh, place to contemplate both our lived life and maybe fantasies or the future. It can transport us back in history or it can bring us forward into the future. Uh, in particular for older adults who may be facing an increasingly circumscribed life, uh, diminished resources, there may be uh, family moving, people that have been important in their lives are no longer there. The arts can provide a vehicle to transport them into a respite from their day-to-day -day lives. And so as this quote shows, um, we know that older adults who attend cultural events, any type really, reported both better mental, but also better physical health than those who did not. And again, these resources are at the end. Um, you all play a critical role. You might not know it for people as they grow older, but I am here to tell you what you do. Now, uh, as Lucas uh, referenced, I'm a gerontologist. I'm a generalist in the field of aging. 
Um, I study everything from financial and environmental considerations to what the community aspects of life are, health and wellness, lifelong learning, social connectedness, and beyond. Um, as you see here, gerontology is the scientific study of old age, the process of aging, and the strengths and deficits of people as they age. It's important to note that this definition used to only say the deficits of people as they age. There are strengths. Um, Louise talked a bit about what was happening nationally. I think it's important to also know what's happening in Chicago. This data is from the 2010 census. There are almost 400,000 individuals age 60 and better. I think the most recent uh, number is around 450,000. Almost 120,000 people living alone. And uh, this is common across the country, although there are increasing needs and numbers of people growing older. We have less resources and declining revenues across the board. And so uh, that creates a real opportunity for consumer-driven and community-driven innovation. Um, people want to stay at home. They want the supports and resources to help them to still live in rich lives as they grow older. And you see bolded here, there's a need for programs to decrease social isolation and loneliness and certainly to increase quality of life. Another movement that is happening around the world, really, uh, but also you'll see it more likely in the United States, is an emphasis on aging in community. Now, we used to see a strong emphasis on what's called aging in place, which is being able to maybe stay in your home. As we've expanded our thinking over the years, we want people to live fully uh, enriched and uh, engaged lives throughout the community as well. And so, um, really, there have been a variety of different initiatives. Uh, the World Health Organization, who knows? Chicago is an age-friendly community. Did you know that? Show of hands? Okay, like two of you. <laughs> we don't actually see it, frankly, between you and I and the signpost. Oh, this is being filmed, isn't it? <laughs> we don't always see it, in instance. There are many cities across our nation that have uh, really fully integrated about how to incorporate the aging experience across all of the different domains that you see here. Housing, public spaces and parks, transportation, services, safety, emergency preparedness, health centers, both the physical and built environment, land use, both formal and informal spaces, the arts, accessibility, and commerce and business. We want aging to be infused throughout those areas to ensure that people throughout their lives have the opportunity for the best livability that they can. And you see here, there's a picture of a really cute little boy uh, running around on some public seating areas in a downtown area in a small town in Wisconsin. Um, but of note, that is accessible to everyone. You could pull up to that in a wheelchair, you could sit down in a walker, you could have a stroller right next to you. These are some of the things when we look at livability that are quite crucial. Another nationwide uh, initiative that we see happening right now is uh, this slide. It features the cover for the Reframing Aging Initiative, which is a social change endeavor that's designed to improve the public's understanding of aging. Um, this is funded, uh, it's funded by a variety of funders, and the idea is to reduce ageism and to guide our nation's approach to ensuring healthy and productive aging for all people across the lifespan. We'll be doing some trainings across the city in 2020 about this. Um, it equates the aging experience in terms of one of justice, of equity, and uh, uh, inclusion across the board. Um, what the Leaders of Aging organization, who are one of the um, people who spearheaded this, we in our field talk very much about ageism, yet the public does not identify it as a problem. Um, there are assumptions about ageism that it's less serious than other forms of discrimination. It's not considered a policy issue, and that really ageism is impossible to address and is uh, 
not as not as important as things like racism um, and, dis and discrimination against people with disabilities. And in order to reframe ageism, we want to talk again about the social injustice and unequal treatment of people, which can lead to exclusion, however unintentionally, um, because oftentimes it's rooted in biases that are implicit or unseen. So um, this is a very important initiative and one that you will see continuing. Now, why do you want to engage older adults? And you've talked about them as your customers, volunteers, and um, as, as donors, but certainly what we know is that learning is lifelong. And we want to combat social isolation and loneliness, and so the arts are a wonderful vehicle to do so. A shared experience can create a sense of belonging. It can give you something to talk about in a life that otherwise might not have a lot of brightness or um, opportunities to share your experiences. Um, as organizations, it increases your impact across the community and deeply within certain pockets. You're reaching an underserved population. Um, a lot of donors are older. Regular donors still make opportunities, still make funding the cultural institutions that they care about important. Um, we also know that grandparents like to spend a lot of money on their grandchildren. And I did hear someone saying they're having a new program for intergenerational opportunities. Older people are also influencers, volunteers, they're often alumni and as we discussed, donors. Now there's a lot of physical changes as we grow older. I, could, I have entire trainings about uh, the changes in working with older audiences. I've included a handout about um, doing presentations. Um, but in particular, for you all, the physical changes of hearing loss and vision loss will probably be the most salient. Um, people sometimes need to get up frequently and have difficulty with ambulation. And so that's something you'll need to be thinking about. Um, but also, the most important probably is hearing loss and vision loss. So as you think about someone on stage and how they are facing the audience, the tone of their voice, how quickly they're speaking, these are all very important things for your staff and your actors, um, your docents to be aware of. Um, and certainly as you think about how things are hung next to a painting. Is it in a lit, lit area? Is it in a certain size font that's readable? Or are people not going to be able to see it? I've worked with certain cultural institutions that um, you can walk in and if you think about the experience of aging, it can be a very different one. Um, so really, uh, you wanna do an environmental scan. And um, as I think about you all, how you can get started, you may want to do a focus group of volunteers or regular patrons. Select some of the people that maybe you think can think about this broadly. Um, surveying your patrons. You know, um, I see surveys come in the mail sometimes, and man, I toss those aside. But gosh, older adults in particular are a group that oftentimes does not feel heard, and they like to fill out surveys. So I would encourage you to do a survey and ask them about their experience. Um, using that data to engage a work group of donors or an impact panel to make changes, just even having that opportunity written up in your uh, playbill can provide people the knowledge that your institution is looking at these issues. Um, we see increased emphasis, we talked about this a bit, groups of people coming together, affinity groups, people based on an interest. Bring them together to visit or to socialize after. Provide a forum for people to convene. Um, and then again, somebody was talking about they were doing grandparents' uh, events for grandchildren. Special engagement, engagements for particular audiences can be very helpful. Oftentimes as you grow older, uh, background noise can be really hard to hear. And so having smaller groups, quieter groups, really thinking through the impact of hearing loss is one I would strongly encourage. Um, and then if you do some shifts in your marketing, um, either in the, the flyers that you have at the uh, at, at events or in when you do mailings and such, I really encourage you to also do some evaluation to look at how uh, changes are made with attendees. We'll talk further in questions about um, other ways to 
uh, involve older people. Um, so I'll look forward to talking further. For the sake of time, this is my transition. Very smooth to Deb. <laughs> well, hi everyone. Um, I'm Deb. Um, I have been um, working in the field of aging as an art therapist for over 20 years, and um, I've worked with individual, like older adults who are institutionalized, living in long-term care settings. Um, and I've also been working with Lucas here for over 10 years, um, working within a museum setting too. So it's sort of interesting coming into cultural spaces as somebody who's coming from an elder care perspective, um, and also as an art therapist. Um, a lot of my work is around um, how can we impact the stigmatization and the marginalization of older adults um, through the arts. And so that's the framework through which I bring into all the stuff that I do. So as we think about um, accessibility, I couldn't help but think about like how do we make these spaces socially accessible to um, older adults. Um, Karen talked a little bit about ageism and the experience of an older adult. Um, I think it's really important that we check our own ages views. Um, I think we make a lot of sub, uh, a lot of um, assumptions, um, and we also make a lot of generalizations. And I think it's really common to do that. Even there here today, we've been talking a lot about older adults, older adults. There are so many intersections um, as individuals and as people, just as everybody else in this room. We all come from extremely diverse lived experiences. And so there is no older adult, um, obviously. Um, but we need to really be thinking about our assumptions. Are we assuming that people have a disability? Are we thinking, I think a really key way to check how we're, how we, um, view older adults is really to think about how we talk to and with them. I think a lot of times people's voices get really high and kind of sing-songy when we start talking to older adults. And why do we do that? Why do we do that? Um, and um, people pick up on that. I remember um, a woman that I worked with, she was in her early 70s, a colleague of mine. She came into work one day and she said, it finally happened. And I said, what happened? She said, I got on the bus and someone said, hi, sweetie, you want my seat? And she's like, I'm trying, I crossed that line. I'm like, I crossed that line and now I'm older and people see me that way and they treat me differently. And so I think we really need to be mindful of that as we communicate. Um, also, how do we co-create spaces for older adults? With meaning, like I think a lot of times we have discussions in groups, in rooms like this, we're like, well, we could do this and we could do that. But like, where are the people that are going to be experiencing these experiences? And why not have that room, this room, be filled with people who are older and um, can share their own lived experiences with us and help us create, we can work with them about creating those spaces. Um, sort of this idea of shifting from doing for to doing with. We talk a lot about that in justice practices, you know, when we think about power um, and think about who has power. People who, I think with also with socially um, making things accessible and like just enjoyable for people, I think we, um, I think sort of considering where the power holds. Older adults were once not older adults and they held the power. <laughs> And then we cross this line and all of a sudden because people aren't productive, they're not as valuable to our society and I think we need to really keep that in mind as we create and design programs within our cultural institutions. Um, so, okay, there's my spiel on that. So now, like, um, why do we make art? Why do we make art? Why do we engage in creative practices? Um, why is that important? And I'm saying like with older adults and people living with dementia, but really this is for all of us, for all people, and we can all benefit from that engagement. Um, developmentally though, as older adults, we become more and more primed to be creative and to engage in creative practices. Um, we have more dendritic connections in our brains and in a healthy 75 year old than in any time during our life. And, and in society, we think like, oh, they're 75, they no longer can't, they can't think anymore or something, you know? But really, they're like, they have the strongest brains. Um, and also, like, we, people cross 
lines, people realize, like, I don't care what people think of me anymore, which kind of opens us up to not being scared to create. Also, we go through this phase of summing up our lives. Like, all of a sudden, all our memories that have been stored up in our brains start coming down, and, and we, they come out of our mouths, and we tell stories, and there's opportunities to share that lived experience. Um, Gene Cohen uh, came up with these human potential stages. You might want to check that out. It's in the resources. Um, socially, um, I'm not going to go into this too much um, because it's already been spoken to, but socially, artists tend to um, experience less depression in general population than non-artists, and also people tend to be a little bit more engaged, and there's a lot of research out there now show, demonstrating that even one hour of a creative activity can have a really large impact. Obviously, when we make art, when we create art, when we move, our nervous system is engaged. Um, either our motor systems, our sensory systems, our visual pathways. We are, if we're strengthening ourselves as we engage in the arts. Um, mental health as well. When we make art, oxytocin gets like um, released. A neurotransmitter gets released in our in our bodies. Serotonin gets released. These are things that impact um, feelings of relaxation and also. Um, less depression. So um, how do we make the overall experience in the, uh, these cultural um, spaces more accessible to as many people as possible? So that's always the question when we're thinking about how to open up these spaces. Um, consider multi-sensory strategies. Karen just talked a lot about how um, we all perceive the world differently and maybe where one person might not be smelling as well as they used to, other people might have hyper <laughs> smell. They might, they really might um, receive and perceive the world really well through their nose because maybe their eyes aren't working because they've been around for 95 years and they're just not working like they used to, right? So how do we create experiences where people are, are encouraged to use all of their senses? Um, also considering diverse learning, learning styles, we all learn different ways. Um, Sometimes, er, okay, I'm resisting going into our the moment program, so I'm not going to give examples yet. Um, and um, and also um, think about ways that we might engage in art in different ways. A lot of times when we're I'm going, I'm going there. When we sometimes when we look at art pieces in the museum, instead of just talking about it or making art about it, we write poetry about in the moment, like about the piece that's right in front of us. Because maybe people are more connected with their words than they are to the paintbrush. Okay, and these last two slides are kind of around memory loss, and I could stand up here and give you tons of tips about like um, ways that you can be successful in engaging people, but I thought maybe. I would give more of like an over, like an umbrella look. Um, so this is a flower um, that this man named Tom Kitwood wrote in 1996 in a book called Dementia Reconsidered. Um, these are the psychological needs of a person living with dementia. These are the psychological needs of all of us, <laughs> not just older adults. Um, we need to feel a sense of love. And how do we feel a sense of love? We feel a sense, we need to feel comfort in our lives, we need to have a good sense of our identity, um, occupation, what's our purpose, um, inclusion and attachment. So I thought about this, like how is this related to cultural spaces? I often use this flower when we're talking about care. But if we think about that, like what is a person with memory loss, what's their identity? We can help people engage in um, looking at art pieces and have them reflect back on how this relates to their life story. If they no longer have access to their life story as we've had in the past, like their identity becomes how they're being interacted with in that moment. So if somebody's like, you know, or like nervous around somebody who has dementia, people are gonna be like, oh no, I'm somebody that people aren't comfortable around, and then that becomes their identity. Um, inclusion, how do we talk with people instead of about people in front of them? I think that that's a big thing that people with dementia talk about a lot. They're like, how come that person's talking about me? I'm right here, hello. We have to be careful that we're not doing that in the, in the spaces, in these cultural spaces. Um, people need to feel comfortable. Occupation, I think a lot of times when we're engaging with people in the gallery, um, or even in the art space in these studios, sometimes people are like, what, what are we doing? Like, what's going on here? Like, why are we doing this? And sometimes, like, this idea of what's the purpose? What's the person's, like, in the moment occupation? What is that about? And so being able to create spaces or be able to be aware of when um, people aren't um, 
really understanding like why what's happening is happening is really important to help people just feel settled and comfortable. Um, attachment is key. Sometimes people want to talk about somebody from their past. Like sometimes a person with dementia might be talking about their mother or their grandmother as if they're as if that person is is with them or alive. And clearly, this person's 95, and their grandmother is probably not alive. Um, but we might need to um, create opportunities. Tell me a little bit about your grandmother. Give people an opportunity to kind of go there in their creative minds or in their memories or in their felt sense. So I, don't know, I just I share this I share this with you. The last thing I want to share with you is sort of how can we engage? How can we be creative about engaging folks living with dementia? And there's um, I pull this resource. This woman talks about. Um, Interacting with people the way you might interact with arts. So we enter, we interact with the art making process with an open attitude. Um, we we see it with with fresh eyes every time. So it might be the same person that's coming to your cultural space on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, and you might think, oh, I know George. George is always this way. Always have fresh eyes because George is going to present in a different way every time. Um, the quality of attention. Give your full attention to the moment um, because you're gonna, there's no judgment. I mean, you can't get let like disabilities or anything kind of get in your way. You're gonna sort of see that person um, and engage with them fully. Um, if we just have, if the quality of our attention is really key. Focus on the potential that's in front of us as opposed to considering, well, she can't do that. She's got dementia. So there's no way she could have a, a meaningful conversation in the moment. Trusting the process. I think a lot of times we, um, we, you know, we have to be okay with not knowing where we're going. We, we don't know where the conversation is going to go, but we have to be cool with that. And wherever it goes, we have to be cool with it. <laughs> um, authenticity. People know when we're being authentic or not. Um, we all know that. That does not get lost. Um, sometimes it's not really pretty, but if somebody looks at a bar piece and they start crying, like how do we hold space and allow for that to happen as opposed to, oh, come on, be happy, be happy, you came here to be happy. Uh, and then last, the tolerance for uncertainty. The goal is not to really accomplish anything, the goal is just to be in the moment um, and be with people. So I'm gonna invite Lucas up here because he's gonna talk a little bit about the Art in the Moment program that we've been working on. Thanks, Deb. Uh, the, uh, I, I love hearing the information about what's going on in our brain when we're engaging with arts and culture or, or, or creating, producing, and expressing ourselves. It reminds me, you said something to me once uh, before about, uh, you compared some, 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 something about the same chemicals going on that when like a, a, a mother holds her child or something like that. It's like it's the same chemical reaction in the brain, so it's, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, well, and, and uh, I'm going to share a little bit about. So we're, now we're going to move into, I guess, the um, section where we're speaking from the, the museum's perspective and speaking from then with Hillary from the performing arts venue's perspective of how we try to uh, actualize a lot of what we're discussing here, and then we'll have some plenty of time for for Q and A. Uh, after this, so but to speak a bit about art in the moment, as um, Deb briefly addressed, and art in the moment is the Art Institute's program. It's yeah, ten years old now, uh, a little more than that, and oh no, it's right on ten years old. Wow, happy anniversary! Yeah. Uh, for, uh, for the our program for individuals who are living with dementia and their care partners, and that's something we always like to emphasize is that it, with the care partners as well. Whether it is a uh, family member or a, uh, a paid caregiver, uh, it's we feel just as critical to uh, involve the care partner um, for the benefit of all, for the benefit of, of the care partner as well as for the benefit of the, uh, uh, the individual with the diagnosis to create a, a, a atmosphere that breaks down the the clinical hierarchies that they might experience day in, day out, to create an atmosphere uh, where uh, the, the maybe the, the fact that uh, there is the diagnosis of dementia, that might even, will create an, an environment where that might very well even be just, just forgotten about and just to allow uh, couples 
or, or parents and children to uh, ha engage in an atmosphere that is, is uh, akin to what they, they uh, had experienced and, and do want to continue to experience. On screen we have um, a, a few photos from the Art in the Moment program, uh, a couple details of the uh, art making process, uh, people gathered around uh, in, in one of these, these studios here, create, creating and producing art, some of the finished products, some of the art supplies, and then a snapshot of us in the galleries of the Art Institute around works of art. The format for the Art in the Moment program, uh, I probably don't have time to go in depth to all of this here, the anatomy of the gallery discussion. The program usually involves a, a about a one hour conversation in front of typically no more than four works of art. And uh, so we take it very slowly, spending about 10 to 15 minutes in front of each work of art. Uh, and then after that we will return to one of these large studio spaces where we're in now for a hands-on art making activity. And this is all uh, organized around a unifying theme, the works that we do explore in the galleries as well as the uh, uh, art making activity. And Deb and I work very closely together to uh, pick the works of art, to develop our um, conversational talking points, uh, structuring the art making activity to ensure that it does have a, a therapeutic value for uh, all individuals involved. Um, on screen we have a, a photo in front of an uh, iconic image in the Art Institute, Sunday on La Grande Jatte, and uh, with the individuals gathered around gesturing at the image. Uh, and, and then the bullets here, this is actually profoundly influenced. I think these, these bullets are, are directly taken from, some of you might be familiar with the MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Alzheimer's project. Uh, and we do have that in the references at the end of the PowerPoint here. Uh, MoMA has put together basically an educator's handbook on how to conduct programming at your museum uh, for individuals with dementia. Uh, many museums around the country have implemented programming that's similar, but each time it's unique in its, its own special way. Uh, the Art Institute's program is very similar too, but certainly a little different from the, the MoMA program. The, at each work of art, we uh, ensure that we do close looking, uh, just silent observation, uh, a careful description, a visual analysis of what we see, and then interpretation. The interpretation aspect is, uh, is very significant because, uh, moving on to the next slide, we don't delve deep into the art history of the work and such, but it's meant to be a very broad, open-ended conversation. Never asking a direct question that could potentially set up someone for failure if they give the wrong answer, if they don't know the answer. Um, but creating an atmosphere where we promote social interaction, social uh, expression, and uh, validation as well. That um, yes, what you have to say, your thoughts and feelings about this work of art, very much do matter. Uh, something I often like to reinforce is the idea that uh, from the moment of uh, the diagnosis of dementia, uh, one is often uh, stripped, that's a very harsh way to say, but often stripped of their, um, their, the rights and privileges that they have previously known. Uh, the, the, it, they often might not be allowed to drive a car. They uh, don't get to say what they're eating or when they're eating, when they bathe themselves, what medicine they take. And so to create an atmosphere where they're granted that decision-making power uh, by expressing what they say about the works of art and validating that is critical. Uh, I, get, I included the various slides here intending that everybody's going to download and carefully go back and look over <laughs> these images, so knowing I don't have time to, uh, to cover all the finer points here. But uh, the, often trying to create a, a multi-sensory engagement through hands-on connections with the works of art. If we can't touch the objects themselves, then to create that hands-on physical connection through analogs, 3D prints on screen. We have a woman handling a 3D printed replica of an object in the Art Institute's collection. 
Uh, and so we are multimodal, uh, uh, multi-sensory beings throughout our whole lives. We learn through all of our senses, and so to uh, enable those pathways for engagement is, is critical for learners of all ages, uh, but, and certainly for older adults who might engage, or might have hearing loss, vision loss, or with dementia, having that concrete physical layer of engagement uh, can uh, often bridge a bit of a uh, communication uh, gap there. And I just very quickly wanted to point out, we were talking a lot about the barriers that older adults may face visiting a, a cultural institution, and so one tremendous strategy to overcome those barriers is to bring your arts and culture to them in place, to their community, to their neighborhood. The Art Institute's Art Insights program, 25 years old now, uh, is a very robust program of, uh, of about 35 trained volunteer educators with the museum, some of whom are in our audience today, visiting different retirement communities, uh, all varieties of places where older adults will congregate not only residential facilities, but also um, places of worship, park districts, libraries, the local senior center. So uh, while it might be very prohibitive for someone to invest their whole day to come to the museum, they're accustomed to going to their local library or their a church or temple or to the, um, the senior center. So it's uh, by bringing the Art Institute out to them is a great way to overcome a lot of those barriers. And I uh, often love to just, uh, uh, trumpet that, um, the, that the volunteerism at the Art Institute is as much a, uh, a rewarding program and experience and an audience. Volunteers, my friends in the audience, I see a few, uh, I sometimes consider you, this is getting meta, to be uh, uh, my audience in as much as you serve an audience too. And so through volunteerism is another tremendous aspect for uh, um, the rewards of arts and cultural engagement that we've been uh, discussing uh, here today. So um, I think uh, we might need to transition on then, um, but moving along to, uh, to Hillary to uh, round out our conversation and provide us with the perspective of the um, performing arts venues. All right, thanks Hillary. Hi everyone. I have no slides, so you're just going to have to uh, listen to me talk for a little while. Um, so I uh, represent more of the music and dance side of the coin, the Harris Theater, the music and dance, which is just a few blocks uh, north of us right now. Um, we work with a variety of different audiences because um, we're mostly a rental house. So every performance usually is in for a day and goes away or maybe in for two days and goes away. So we're working with a lot of different types of audiences and, and kind of adapting depending on uh, each group. So I think one of the biggest things that cultural institutions can do and a good starting spot, whether you're thinking about aging audiences or just accessibility is assessing your space. What are the barriers physically in your space? Walk through your space, knowing what those things are, the things that you can bring attention to, um, whether through your website, whether through, um, if you have a contact person who's your access contact person, that you're prepared for the barriers that are for someone coming to your space. If you're thinking about your website, what are those barriers? Are they accessible? Um, how can someone navigate the pages on your website? Um, and as I said, not, you know, making sure that you do have that contact person that someone can reach out to if they have specific facility questions, whether it's about accessible services or just navigating your space or asking about drop-off points or parking or how close you're going to be to the front door. Um, I think those are really good places to start. And then really, I think for us as cultural institutions, frontline staff training is key. Um, so when you are doing your access and inclusion training or your diversity training, 
of thinking how you can also layer on the conversation about the aging population. Um, what are the things that are, you know, um, universal in that? Sorry, I keep hitting the, the keyboard. Uh, what are the things that are universal to folks who might be requiring accessible accommodations and for aging adults? Um, and really having, having that built out for your staff so that they know etiquette, they aren't doing some of the things that we've been talked about, like talking, maybe baby talking or talking down to communities visiting your space, that they're prepared with all the options that you have in house. Um, as this was also mentioned earlier, options are key. So your frontline staff knowing all the options for seating, uh, what, what are the things you have on site, um, assistive listening devices, performances that could be captioned, um, audio described performances. I think these are all things that frontline staff um, should be prepared with. Um, I feel like, in my experience, a lot of the barriers when it comes to maybe aging adults who don't necessarily identify as having a disability is actually having the conversation about what someone might need or benefit from and really being able to put that out there without making someone feel like they've been targeted as someone who might need a support service. So something that I, I went to a really cool session at LEAD, the Leadership Exchange in Arts and Disability Conference this summer about person first service, or sorry, yeah, service first, service first uh, training. And it was really centered around like your box office staff and thinking about does your box office staff, how does your box office staff present information about access for your venue? Um, how can we as institutions always be presenting the information about what we have to everyone whenever there's a, um, you know, a transaction going on? Are, they, are we able to build out scripts that say, we see that you, you, know, you purchased these tickets, that's great, just so you know, we have assistive listening devices available on site, we have uh, wheelchairs available, we have, you know, there are open captioning performances coming up, like how do we build out those layers as frontline customer service staff, so that it's not like an, a conversation where you have to like think about, oh, this person specifically needs this. It's about everyone. It's the universality of offering that to everyone on the phone or online and making sure that that is something that your staff is becoming comfortable with that language and knows how to have that conversation for everyone as opposed to just specific folks. Um, I will say too, uh, Something that we have been trying to sort of adapt in our space is, you know, the conversation about how we talk to, to patrons about what they need, um, as opposed to kind of phrasing things as to, as in the, in like, how can I help you for everyone that's coming in that you might identify as maybe needing help, um, of rephrasing it to be more of a, I'm here to help you, and not maybe kind of putting someone in a position where they're really having to say what they need or feeling pressured to say that they need help for me more in of a way of like, I'm here to help if you need anything and having those kind of rephrasing things like that. Um, something else that for box office and really customer service is thinking about how we consider the personal care assistant or someone who might be helping someone. Um, you know, how do we consider their experience with being in the space. Are they getting, are they able to have a, a ticket or a complimentary ticket as well along with who they're helping? You know, how, do we, how are we navigating those conversations and making sure that they feel included in the experience? And really thinking about how a lot of our programming that we do in different spaces really has a universality to it. Um, you know, if, you, if you're doing sensory friendly programming, it's not necessarily only something that can be a benefit for folks with sensory processing disorders or on the spectrum. It could be, really could be something that would be a benefit for an aging population group who, you know, having that relaxed environment, the relaxed rules about theater experiences might then make them feel less fearful about being in a space where they don't know what the perception is going to be of that, of that uh, performance and that engagement. Um, making sure that uh, you have resources in your space posted. Um, we try to make sure that we have information about all the things that we have on site, because not everybody is obviously an online person who is going to necessarily look for things, but if you have things maybe at your box office about what you have for every engagement, like 
um, we have large print material, large print program books, or we have this today, or um, really making sure that that's visibly somewhere that someone can look at when they're in your space. And, um, uh, and another thing that's been helpful for our staff too is creating some resources that um, could have universality for anyone coming, such as a social narrative or a know before you go video, if you're familiar with those, where it kind of outlines your space and shows you how you enter this space, what are you, know, you gonna encounter, where are the box office, where are things located, and knowing that that could have um, a real larger appeal than just maybe for uh, sensory friendly performances or, or things of that nature. And um, we also have created like a step chart. Um, so we have a downloadable uh, step chart for our theater, so it tells you how many stair steps there are to each row in the theater. Um, that's been a really helpful tool for our box office staff and you know working with a lot of different organizations you know that could be something that comes up a lot and it happens a lot in our box office we get that conversation about how we navigate to this space um, because we have so many different audiences coming through um, and that's been a great tool to share with a lot of our other companies yeah and just really it all comes back to for us like training and just making sure people have a good sense of how to have the conversation, how to talk about options, and it's not just frontline staff. You know, we're really thinking as well about um, our volunteers, making sure they have some of that language and etiquette. That they, um, we also are sharing with our development staff and marketing staff because, as we all know, we have very a lot of us have very special engagements that are for a very specific group of high-level donor, trustee, folks who might fall into this category, who might not really know the resources are there, um, but they're not really talking to your box office staff, they're probably talking to your development staff and making sure that they know all the tools that are available and accessible to them um, so that they just have a good sense of being welcome in your space. So those are just a few things and I'm sure we can talk more. So wonderful, thank you. Thanks to the whole panel for this uh, great uh, conversation. And uh, as Hillary has already kind of previewed for us, we do have some resources here. <laughs> where this is not the extent of it, don't worry. We got, this, this is another slide, and this is another slide, and this is another, and another. And I think this is the last one here. That's great. So, and uh, uh, we certainly wanna Thank you all. We have still plenty of time left to engage in the Q&A portion. We allotted lots of time for that. And um, we also received a good number of questions in advance that you all submitted through the registration page. Uh, a lot of the questions, some of the questions were, were similar, so we're kind of lumping a bit of that together. And uh, maybe I might begin with uh, one question here that somewhat a little bit maybe, maybe paraphrasing, um, but the idea is that um, so with older adults who visit the, your organization, what are some of the best ways to ensure that older adults can engage with uh, whether it's through with, uh, if they have a disability, if it's hearing loss, vision loss, uh, uh, limited mobility. How do you uh, well a make sure that they are aware of your resources and services if they do not necessarily identify with having a disability? I think once I might have heard that uh, it, it, it's often the case that someone might have almost like a 30% hearing loss before they start thinking about visiting an audiologist, wondering maybe it, it's not just everybody's mumbling these days. Uh, so uh, how to make these resources uh, 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 available, Hillary has certainly covered a, a good bit of that in terms of promoting it online and, and in print. Uh, and announcing at the onset of programs that these services and resources are available. But then also, how do you uh, 
not make people who feel uh, perhaps uh, I don't know how, uh, how do you how do you normalize I guess is a good phrase so to the um, access to these resources and services that you provide uh, if people don't want to identify with having uh, a disability so I don't know uh, I mean I have my own thoughts and comments about that um, I think just in terms of normalization one thing I like to do is yeah well to to normalize accessibility that is I know when when I'm giving a tour in the museum and when I uh, and what I try to encourage with other um, tour guides that I, I work with is that when going transitioning from one floor to the next, for example, always take, if a ramp is available, by default go down the ramp or up the ramp instead of the stairs, but certainly point out the stairs that they're available. Uh, or also, if often we might take an elevator or go up and down a large flight of steps, and instead of saying, okay, who, who wants to take the elevator? Oh, okay, well, the elevator group, you go in there and we'll meet you on the second floor. You take the elevator, we'll see you up there. Uh, instead, uh, I'll say, I'm, I'm, uh, who, does any, if anybody wants to take the elevator, I'll go with you in the elevator. And so I accompany the, the elevator group, and then those who take the stairs, I'll say, okay, and for those of you who prefer to take the stairs, we'll meet you there at the top of the staircase there. So in that sense, it just, it just turns it around, and therefore normalizing the condition that someone might not be able to take the stairs. But I don't know if anybody has any additional thoughts or comments about uh, people who don't identify as having disabilities, how to make them aware, and then also how to, yeah, just normalize it. Yeah, please. So, um, Luke is right, 30% of people age 16 and over have hearing loss, half of people age 85 and better. Um, training, as Hillary brought up, is crucial. Um, your team should know to always look at people when they're talking to them, um, because what happens is people read your lips, and if I'm looking over here while I'm talking, oftentimes people won't hear you. So I think the training is really crucial. Um, Deb alluded to your, your, the tone of voices. Higher voices, women's voices in general, are much harder to hear. And so um, encouraging people to speak slowly, um, speak in a, in, a, in a louder tone if you need to, but yet don't start shouting when someone comes up you know, that looks older. Um, I think also, um, I think Debbie alluded to it, not talking to the person, talking to the caregiver or the attendant. You know, when I'm with uh, doctors, are notorious for this. I'll go to a doctor's office with someone, and they'll talk to me instead of a client. And I just turn and look at the person I'm with and, and pretend like I'm not being spoken to. So, I mean, really just um, the training is really crucial, and not just for your front-end staff. You want your... Uh, development staff to know this for when they're working with donors or your volunteer administrators to know these things as well. Um, I think something else that I didn't really hear spoken about today is having adequate paid places to sit down and rest throughout the galleries and you know if you're doing a gallery tour um, maybe choosing a piece that is in an area that has some seating and that's good for you know the person with a bum knee it's good for uh, an older adult who may be arthritic. It's good for a, a mom with her kid. So I think continually um, trying to normalize the experiences, like I said, is something that is certainly crucial. No, that's a great point. And, and often when Deb and I are, are putting a program together, we will con consider ideas uh, around yeah well is there is there a bench there uh, is it is the work large enough you know is it is it a space where we can sufficiently gather a group of people around uh, so a lot of, a lot of those factors uh, to try to just create that that very universally or in inclusively designed experience Lucas if I can just add on you alluded to this uh, people who need an attendant in the washroom with them um, you know, sometimes at intermissions it shows the women's line is really long, um, so that can be a challenge. Having seats in the bathroom, having a lot of seats in the lobby 
even if it's just a chair like this that's sitting there, and you will be shocked at the amount of people that were sit down and making sure that your team knows to um, have adequate signage places that say, here's a, a larger washroom, uh, washroom that's accessible for multi-people, gender neutral washroom, whatever it may be. That's also something that is really quite crucial. Yeah, and, and then also just about uh, designing for accessibility, uh, absolutely, and, and so the, should not the gallery, we, instead of creating large type, large print brochures and large print labels, um, could just increasingly lobbying for that being more the, the standard, right? And the great way to phrase it is uh, to, to the curator and the, and the uh, and to the, uh, the design department, like, well, don't you want your visitors to read the labels, right? <laughs> so, no, but uh, then I guess um, another question that uh, came up is, um, well, in terms of technology, uh, there was a, a couple of different questions that were inquiring about technological literacy among older adults, and so, uh, how can we can we assume how much can we assume and, and can how can we uh, incentivize older adults to access our uh, all of our uh, our touch screens in the galleries uh, smartphone apps and how many uh, accessibility features can we put in the smartphone app assuming that the audience then would be able to access them I don't know if we have any information about technological literacy among older adults. So, <laughs> um, yes, I'm working with a geriatrician actually using technology to help older adults maintain some kind of activity if they're, let's say, frail or have a fall and they need to undergo a continuous kind of physical therapy regime so that they can stay functional and not end up being institutionalized. And so the first question was, you know, is this a non-starter? What older adult is going to be able to use the technology? We've recently branched out and are using voice activated, of, you know, Alexa, for lack of a better word, um, and eliminating a layer of interface that is often off putting for older adults. Having said that, if you're talking about smartphones and other technology, smartphones themselves are not as popular among older adults as, let's say, iPads, and it's primarily size-related. They can see it better. I can see it better. So that's an important part of this, and of course, hearing it is also an issue if you're gonna have an app and you're wanting to listen to people do a little story about what, the, what they're seeing. You know, it's going to be potentially challenging to rely on one sense. So if you have an iPad and you've got oral as well as visual, you know, text display that's coinciding, you're going to improve your capacity to reach that kind of clientele. Yeah, and I think when developing any uh, technology product for your organization, you know, if it's some sort of an app, whether it's a downloadable app or something in the galleries, I think it's important to ensure that it uh, is, is adaptable. Uh, it's one size does not fit all, and so I know uh, before I got my new bifocals prescription, uh, I was uh, often accessing the uh, built-in features of uh, my iPhone to increase font size. And uh, then there are certain apps, though, that I use that don't respond to the uh, iOS's built-in uh, accessibility features. So ensuring that your uh, your, your uh, in in your institution, whether it's a permanent installation like a touch screen or uh, a, a app on your on a device, make sure that those can uh, are responsive to those features of fonts increasing and adjusting contrast and things of those those sort. I just wanted to reinforce that working with the older adult, a number of us have said this. We learned a lot just by working with the older adults who were our potential clients to develop this app because we could not assume to know what was going to work. And yes, you see a lot of diversity, but it's only by getting that input that you're going to be able to target the people you want to you know, address their needs. I think also sending out advance notice. Uh, Hillary talked about a welcoming guide. If somebody's buying tickets online, if they're buying tickets to um, you know, your theater and there's some background information or an app about the history of the institution, 
putting it in the email that goes out with it highlighted so that people have time to download it in advance. Having a QR code there or something so that people don't actually have to like go to the app store, look for it, download it. Kind of cutting out as many steps as you can is something that's important. And maybe um, having, of course, written instructions in addition to someone just saying, oh, just download the app. That would be something else I would think that would um, enrich people's, uh, enhance the likelihood of them being able to use it at that moment. Yeah, um, uh, one quick uh, question I also want to address and then we maybe open it up to to the, everyone here. Um, but there was a question that I hummed and hawed and it's, it's, I still don't have the perfect answer, but uh, questions about um, supporting older volunteers and especially those who might not have uh, come to to, to terms, I guess, with um, as one ages, one might age out of being able to uh, support and, and fulfill the primary functions of what the role as a volunteer is. And so how to uh, work with aging volunteers in that sense, uh, certainly uh, I, may, I think one, one very small uh, solution in a sense that uh, that I like to uh, offer is just even if a um, someone is not able to continue um, providing the service of, of their volunteerism just creating a emeritus volunteer status that allows them to continue to remain engaged in uh, and visit your venue continue to remain with their volunteer status to have free access to your venue to continue to come to training sessions. So providing these avenues to remain culturally engaged and maintain the, the level of cultural engagement that they are accustomed to, uh, though transitioning to a point that they, they don't uh, necessarily, are not required to or maybe no longer permitted to um, offer the, the volunteer service that they had previously provided. But uh, I think there are some other brilliant minds up here that would have some something to weigh in on that. <laughs> I don't know if it's brilliant, but I like this idea. And what I think would also work would be to allow those people then to teach the next generation, mm. and share their wisdom. Yeah. So oh, yeah, with volunteers, so I spent many years working with older adults in volunteer engagement. So are you doing an annual review of the volunteer? That's something that should happen irrespective of age so that you're able to kind of tap into those things. So your volunteer coordinator maybe should be doing that. Um, acting as a, as a, as a uh, uh, sharing your knowledge, um, becoming almost uh, training the next generation, sometimes putting people together in teams. Um, doing, you know, when you do your annual volunteer check-in, you can talk about are there other opportunities that you might like to have, and you might do that every year. And so that you're able to, as someone continues to become involved, stays involved in your institution, you can find other paths. People have so many talents that are untapped. And so um, I think that they, it can be a real life what to stay involved in an institution they care about. And so really continuing to find that path. And I love your idea, Lucas, of continuing a status of uh, an emeritus or something as well. So um, should we then open it up to Q&A, comments, thoughts, feelings? Uh, we do have a microphone here, Susan, so if, uh, we definitely want you to speak into the microphone if you have a question. Don't be shy, raise your hand, shout out, say, hey, I have a question, uh, what stomp your feet, whatever you prefer. And we do have one there. Hello, um, I'm Minette from the Art Institute. Um, my question's for all of you, perhaps, maybe um, for Louise. Uh, what, what's kind of the next um, phase of research, do you think? What questions are um, people really interested in now that it seems to be pretty established that, that arts engagement um, contributes to people's well-being? Um, are there specific questions within that umbrella that you think still need more attention? Yeah, it's, there's actually, of all the areas that I work in that are relevant to social isolation and loneliness, these arts 
cultural engagement interventions are relatively under-researched or poorly researched. They're just, we're not collecting the kind of quality data in a lot of cases that really help make a case for its value. Um, that is changing. I think one of the things that's coming on stream, and, and I think maybe several of us here have alluded to this, it's the idea of intergenerational arts creation. That's, I think, a hot issue right now because of just intergenerational um, concern more generally, that there's value to doing intergenerational work for purposes of reducing ageism, for economic reasons. You might have heard of programs where young adults who can't afford an apartment have find a place to live in a, in a senior assisted living facility and they have a, a working arrangement and how that's going to benefit both sides. There are lots of ways that we could be looking at how intergenerational work could be um, a strength of, of you know, cultural venues, how they offer their things. And, and the, that needs to have more research. And certainly a lot of research on what, I think for all of you, I think we need more research on the barriers that um, that we can address for people who would be attending but aren't. So we know a lot about the people who come. We don't know anything much to speak of about the people who don't come but might want to come. And how can we learn more about that and how we can help deal with that? <coughs> Hi, my name is Matt, and I, I caption theater and other live events, and I'm sitting next to a guy named Martin who, who uh, this audio describes uh, theater and other live events. My, my question is, I love the idea, Hillary, of, of uh, like the concept of normalizing something like open captions, because I know that someone uh, who might have, might have uh, low vision or, or loss of hearing would not identify as deaf, may not know what the two words open captioning even means. And yet, when I go to a lot of these theaters, there there's an enormous amount of people that are enjoying the captions. And it, I know because they tell me afterwards. Is there, short of depending on the theater or event, trying to normalize it on their side? If I don't have control over that, how how could I help in the normalizing process? I can't change the name of it to subtitles, because it isn't actually subtitles, but is it, do you guys have any idea of, of ways that maybe uh, the normalizing could be on both sides? <laughs> I don't have an answer to this, but one of the things that I just keep hearing, and I really resonate with it because as I get older myself, I see the sense in it, and that is this notion of universal. It doesn't have yeah. to be for anybody. It's just there, and we tend to want to categorize, and we have this big chunk of normal adults, and then we have these special populations. Even within normal, there's a range and lots of variability, and we want to deal with all of it. So, universal. <laughs> Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think that at, in my work at the Art Institute, where um, our departments in the school, I think too, but definitely our department, we're working on making syllabi that are that are just they're for all. Instead of instead of putting the onus on the person with the disability to ask for that disability and to get have their experience be altered in some way, our syllabi are just inclusive. Like this is we recognize that there are diverse learners here. We recognize that. Um, you know, that anyone can ask and be in conversation with their with their like professor around their, their access needs and all of that stuff and like just sort of making it a part of everyday life you know so maybe having open cap cap captioning um, at every event <laughs> no matter whether we know there are people with disabilities in the room there will be <laughs> um, but you know, like, how do we, you know, maybe we talk about it at parties. <laughs> I like we're not even, like, in that realm. And just, yeah, like, how do we make people aware of it? Yeah. It's a great question. I'm, I sing in a chorale. South uh, Suburban, well actually it's the South Holland Master Corral, but anyway. We, at every concert, have a woman signing. You 
can't sign the musical pitch, obviously, but she's signing the words and she has dramatic gestures. I don't know that we've ever had a hearing impaired person in the audience, but everybody loves to have her present and giving another dimension to the music. Yeah, I would just ch um, champion that um, in terms of if you are responsible for programming or if you have a relationship with the folks who are responsible for programming in your institution, it's having the conversation about programming with access in mind, not programming because you are being reactionary to a, a request. Um, so really thinking about how you can build, how you can budget for those things and start create these layers within your own institution where people are seeing it or they're hearing it and it's being demonstrated within your spaces, even though there might not be anybody in the audience who is identifying as having, as requiring that service. And I think that's something that cultural institutions have a lot of resources in this city to begin breaking down a lot of those barriers of just, it's here because it should be part of it and we plan with access in mind. Something that we've started to do at our institution is in our sort of slow push in this direction, is talking about these as program enhancements. Mm -hmm. So it's like, wouldn't you love to have that at your program? So kind of sell it on that way to our own staff and our own programmers to say, here's something else, you can, another dimension you can add to your program. And we've, um, we're starting to get people to budget for it initially, so it's not like, oh, now I have to like grab this budget. It's like, it's there, if you don't use it, it's just a gift to somebody else. So. <laughs> it's a little, a little bit apples to oranges, but uh, not with captions, but with, assisted listening devices and or the, the group tour system the devices we are offering here at the back of the room and we sometimes make those available for the museum's public tours that we have here every day and uh, it, i find i really see that it's, it's all about just how you pitch it as to whether or not the, the attendees will opt into using the device uh, and certainly, if you phrase it as this is a, you know, an assistive listening device for people who are hard of hearing, then very few people will uh, you know, identify themselves to the rest of the group and go up and help themselves, yes, I would like one of those because I'm hard of hearing. But, and that's often not even the reason that people may sometimes borrow the device. They might prefer to linger at the back of the crowd and still be able to hear. They might like to wander a little bit from the tour group. Uh, and so and I phrase it, if anybody would enjoy having some audio amplification, then we do have these devices that will uh, allow you to turn up the volume. Plus also people who are non-native English speakers uh, will enjoy turning it up louder. I know my. My native German mother, she loves to crank the volume up really loud and always has, even before. I mean, she might have a little hearing loss now, but that's beside the point. But uh, yeah, so, so it's about how you will phrase these. I don't know how, Matt, that's going to help with captions, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I think sort of along those lines too, the Art in the Moment program, um, whenever I'm not speaking in front of a piece, I always wear the assistant device as well. Um, and yeah, and like I think that there are sometimes the volunteers, not the volunteers from here, but like some of the people that come and help them, oh no, 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 no. And like other people, like they're kind of adamant about not using it and I can't help but wonder if that's because like we tend to other people, you know, and so I think there's some power in joining, and so that's like sort of my small little thing that I do in that program, it's just I would. Yeah, so like having staff opt in as well, so uh, likewise when we borrow stools or make stools available for a, a gallery program, uh, then having the, the support personnel also use a stool just so it's not that uh, looking like only those who have uh, you know, limited mobility would be using the stools, yeah. Questions more? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you. My name is Atticus. I work here at the Art Institute as well. It's Annette and my colleagues here and here. Um, I just, so my grandmother has dementia. She's, she's you know, nearing the end of her life, I think. Um, but when I visit her, I, I would really like to like engage in some of these artistic practices and but she was never really an artistic person in her life before she had dementia. So I'm wondering if you had suggestions on how to engage someone with dementia who never really 
participated in art before. Um, I think that's a, that's a really great question. I think one key thing is to consider how we, do, do how we define creativity and what art is and what creativity is. Um, for someone with, a, with dementia, like sort of figuring out a way to like button your shirt in a different way is a very creative endeavor. Um, and so sometimes it's about like maybe reframing the way we're thinking about that type of engagement and like how do we create um, problem solving challenges with a creative element to it um, as maybe an entry point. Um, another thing that I would definitely recommend is like we do, do it together. Bring in the materials and be like, hey, I just learned this thing. <laughs> I'm going to try to do this. I brought some extra if you want to try too. And maybe she will just watch in the beginning. Um, and, you know, as dementia progresses, two people's understanding of the world outside of themselves may oftentimes gets quite distorted. And so um, she might not know like, what a pencil is anymore. Um, and so being able to see that that's what you're doing, like a lot of uh, using, dude, modeling is really key. Um, I think also showing what, really explaining like why, like maybe if there's a purpose behind the making, like, oh, I'm making this card for so-and-so, you wanna help me with it? Let's work on it together. Um, and also like exploring different avenues, like maybe sh maybe the art making might not be the entry point, maybe it's music, maybe it's movement, maybe it's another way of her to express herself in a different way, and you can make your way to the art. Thank you. Is that helpful? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Hi, my name's Carrie. Hi, um, Santa. <laughs> My question also comes from a, a personal, uh, my family, my uncle has dementia, but I think it, this has really been um, giving me a lot of ideas for my professional practice as well. And I'm wondering, I'm thinking about the frustration he experiences, um, especially re-engaging with things that he used to engage with more. And that, but now he's having, like he has some awareness that he's having to engage with them in a different way. Or, and I think part of it might be that he think approach differently. So I, I really appreciated your speaking about how people interact, like education around people that interact with um, people with dementia who are experiencing the cultural spaces. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, so I just was wondering about like with programming, um, if you, if there are strategies for dealing with the frustration that people might be experiencing when they um, are engaging in a different way or not able. That, something you said about the art in the moment spoke to me as well about not presenting questions that they may know that they should know the answer to or they used to know the answer to. I think that that's really, I mean, that's important for a lot of audiences. But I was wondering about other strategies of that because for, and it might just be my uncle himself and his personality <laughs> or the situation, his specific situation, but I, but I do think that that frustration might be more universal and it could be a barrier as well to the engagement or wanting to re-engage after an initial engagement if that frustration is experienced. So I was hoping you could speak to that about how you approach the programming. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think one key thing as far as programming is really reading the room and reading um, people's comfort level. Um, I remember one time we were in front of a piece and somebody was talking about something. We had a new docent and somebody was talking about the piece and it was they were saying something that wasn't true. And the person up in front of the piece was like, no, 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 it's this. It's No, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, no, no, really, it's this. And, and the woman got so agitated that she had to get up and leave. Um, so I think like not challenging is really key and like following that, following the moment, following the journey, like, you know, if uh, also, yeah, so like if somebody's frustrated, like validating that frustration I think is really key too, you know? So if someone's like, oh, so that you know that they're frustrated, just be like, oh, that looks so frustrating. Like name it, like join them, join them in that moment. Um, and um, yeah, so I think like that, the, as far as programmatically, we don't necessarily know the people that we're with, but we, are, we have ways of being in the world that is the same. And so reading that and joining, and like, because oftentimes when you join people through validation, you join them there, and then you, you literally walk out of that frustration with them. I, I have so many stories around that in particular. Um, 
I think having, there's no right answer to, like don't ask questions that are like, so like what color is this even? You know, if someone says blue, another person says brown, another person says purple, I just say, oh, this person over here sees brown. Oh, this person over here sees blue. Wow, this is incredible. Like, we all can be looking at the same thing and we see different things. How wonderful is that? And like, what a beautiful world we live in <laughs> that we can all be looking at the same thing and see different things. So, it's like we're being creative in the moment. We're playing, we're reading the room, basically. I'd say also I'm a quilter and my uh, mother-in-law is uh, in her late age just pretty severe cognitive impairment, and she taught me to quote, and she was amazing. But she can't spell, <clears throat> pardon me anymore. So I went to go see her in England over the summer, and I was assessing her capabilities. And um, I was looking through some sewing stuff with her, just the act of looking through her fabrics, looking at the threads, looking at the things she had made, was part of the actual joy that she had that day. And then um, she, I noticed that she had some pieces of a quilt. Now, before she would have been focused on the sewing, but what we did is we laid it out and there was a couple rows that were unfinished. So I said, oh, will you, can we work together to figure out where the squares should go and then actually, you know, help me pin them together. So she was able to do a different type of experience that was a part of her passion. And I don't think it occurred to her, oh, but I'm not sewing. She still got so much enjoyment that day. And what I saw um, from when we started is she was so much calmer and um, you know more at ease throughout the rest of the day. And so uh, I think you can reframe the artistic experience. It's setting up the paint, it's touching the brushes, it's it's not just the actual painting itself, it's the entire uh, multi-sensory area. Just to add on to that, I think in designing programs as well, like every pro art project that we do, I really think through like what are the different levels of engagement that are allowed in this process. So I would never choose a project that we would make that there's only one way to do it or that there, there can be, it can be a project that can be extremely complex but also be completely simple. And so people can be successful across that line. And so I think really thinking ahead about people's abilities is important. And just to kind of speak on the opposite side of the conversation, when it, if someone's getting frustrated and you have your frontline staff and thinking about in a performance setting, you're in the concert and maybe someone you know is experiencing something in a way that is causing them to have a reaction, we as the cultural entity need to be prepared to empower our staff to have conversation with patrons who are around this situation, who could be like, what's going on? I'm watching, like, what, this person's making a disturbance, like, I need to be moved. You know, how are we, in addition to the accessible program that we have um, for all other types of disabilities, uh, how are we thinking about what, what language our staff is empowered with to have that conversation, to, to, to vouch for the, the institution, for that patron, um, who's experiencing something in a very specific way, but also be able to have like a, a moment or a teaching opportunity with someone who might be just agitated that this is happening and they're having their performance experience disturbed in their minds, you know, of, um, and how we are really setting up the tone for that and, and kind of helping to eliminate some of those barriers for people to feel okay to come. Well, I think we are getting close to five, and we love to leave a few minutes just for, for socialization and networking and uh, informal conversations. But once again, I really want to thank our panelists here for bringing their expertise. And Fade to Black, white text on black background, serving older adults and in cultural institutions, presented by Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium. For workshop resources and more information, visit chicagoculturalaccess.org. Presenting speakers. Moderator, Lucas Livingston, Assistant Director of Accessibility and Lifelong Learning at the Art Institute of Chicago. Deb Del Senor, an art therapist specializing in older adults and an educator for Art in the Moment at the Art Institute of Chicago. Louise Hockley, Senior Research Scientist at NORC, University of Chicago. Karen Kolb Flood, gerontologist, an expert in engagement of and community development for older adults. 
Hilary Pearson, CCAC Steering Committee Member and Manager of Operations at Harris Theatre for Music and Dance. Workshop Accessibility, Kathy Raycan, Real-Time Captioning. Video Editing, Captioning and Audio Description by BridgetMelton.com. Video Fades to Black.